thank you very much for inviting me to speak with you today. It's an honor and a pleasure to be here. Today, I want to share some reflections with you about Spanish democracy, about some of the impacts of 15M, and some of the challenges that I think we still face today. And I know you've been listening all morning to people, so I hope you can bear with me through this talk. I'll take you on a bit of a journey through some different things that I've been thinking about lately. Last year, I was giving a talk at Cambridge about online and offline activist communication strategies in the 15M in Madrid. And after I finished my talk, a learned professor asked me one of those questions that falls into the common sense arena in academia. He said essentially, well, that's all very well, but what has it achieved? All of that effort and everything has stayed the same. Austerity politics are still in place, and the same government is still in place. Of course, this kind of question already has within it a conception of social movement, success, and impact that is very narrowly focused on short-term political outcomes. In my own work, and indeed on my book, Social Movements and Globalization, this narrow conception of the political is something that I have argued very strongly against. If we think about social movement impact as consisting of overturning particular policies, implementing new laws or new policies, removing parties from government, or even, in Gamson's classic formulation, simply being taken seriously by political elites as an interlocutor, then no, of course we would have to conclude that 15M was something of a failure. But to make that analysis is to understand nothing about what has happened in Spain, and more broadly to understand very little about social movements and processes of social transformation. So if we go back to that question about 15M, what has it achieved? My off-the-cuff answer to that question in the context of a talk about communication strategies essentially was that activist communication strategies have been used to relentlessly counter hegemonic narratives of the crisis, of austerity, of democracy, and that this relentless contestation had in fact served to discredit and delegitimize the government and to reconfigure common sense in Spanish society around the very meaning of democracy. Of course, as Elena's paper showed us, this is not all that activists in 15M have done. They've also engaged in all sorts of direct actions, such as stopping evictions, reoccupying bad bank-owned buildings. They've initiated transformative collaborative projects, such as food banks and ethical banks. They've done crowdfunding to support indictments against bank directors and others responsible for the crisis, and so on. But perhaps the most radical transformation has been to fundamentally question the widely shared consensual understanding of the meaning of democracy in Spanish society as being defined by the narratives that justified the political pacts that were made during the Spanish transition. And that transformation cannot be measured in short-term narrow political terms. That can only be understood within a broader understanding of the transformation of political culture, a transformation that has not only led to the questioning of consensus around democracy up to that point, but which has also laid the terrain for new institutional political projects such as Podemos and the many alternate municipal movement-based candidacies that are emerging right now in Spain. And no politician of any color can refuse to engage with the items that the movement has placed on the agenda, even if it means doing so in the most transparently hypocritical way imaginable. In the terms proposed by Laclau and Mouf, building on Gramsci, we can say that the 15M movement managed to articulate new imaginaries that can generate the mobilization of social majorities who understand themselves as a collective political actor. And that is no small thing. As Errejón writes, at the center of Laclau's thought were the questions of how the capacity to create consent and legitimacy functioned, and in particular, 
how and under what conditions the people at the bottom could overturn their subordination and form a historic bloc directing and organizing the political community. But conceiving of political change in the terms that frame many discussions on the left that are in vogue now as the mobilization of those on the bottom against those on the top, essential as they are, has certain limitations. Because as Kerman Calvo and others have pointed out, this conception of politics as being a contest between those at the bottom and those at the top runs into serious problems when we consider such social problematics as patriarchy and how we can overcome it. Within this narrative of 99%, how can we understand the problem, for example, of homophobia or racism or violence against women? Calvo asks provocatively, isn't it true that ordinary people can be violent and abusive and discriminatory? Can't one be bad without being a member of the political elite or the casta? So Calvo discusses some of the implications of this narrative for feminism in 15M and Podemos, noting that only a few of the 15M assemblies voted explicitly to adopt a gender equality resolution. And that in Podemos's constituent process, the resolution on feminism got only 7% of the vote, placing it in 16th place overall. Calvo explains that this is partly strategic, an attempt to find the least common denominator that will unite the greatest range of people. But he also stresses this fundamental tension between the discourse of indignation and the promotion and recognition of the rights and needs of specific groups within the population, women, gays, immigrants, etc. Interestingly, in a country where gender has never been a factor in explaining voting patterns, Podemos is the only party with a five-point gap between men and women, with men being five points more likely to vote for Podemos than women. With respect to the threat to abortion rights posed by the then Minister of Justice, Gallardón, Carolina Descansa, the only female member of the Podemos Cúpula, declared that abortion was not an issue that constituted transformative political potential and therefore was not a priority. Given the hundreds of thousands of men and women who traveled from all over Spain to take to the streets for abortion rights in one of the largest protests of the 87,000 protests we've had in Spain in the past two years, this is a very bizarre statement indeed. And the only explanation I can find for this statement is that abortion does not fit neatly into the relentless desire to stay on message with one mantra. We need to get rid of the political caste. The implication being that once we do so, issues like abortion rights will be taken care of. We've been here before. This is really the same message we've heard now forever on the left. Only now, there's an attempt to frame it beyond left and right. I think we need to be aware of the limitations as well as the possibilities of certain forms of political discourse and its implications for how we actually construct transformative political structures. I've argued that 15M called into question the consensus around the legitimacy of Spanish democracy after the transition and it galvanized millions of people. Of course, we cannot overlook the importance of the context of the crisis on Spanish society, the levels of ontological insecurity, the feelings of loss of hope and belief in the governing parties to care for the citizens or even to care about the citizens, the social devastation caused by mass unemployment, the mass foreclosures and evictions, <coughs> the eviction-related suicides, the witnessing of hunger on the streets of our cities, and so on. But the left-right cleavages that have defined the Spanish political landscape for so long and until very recently has also been broken down. So on the one hand, we have a breakdown of consensus 
around the legitimacy of a political regime put in place during the transition, a breakdown of consensus over the legitimacy of the institutions of Spanish representative democracy, but it's accompanied by a partial dissolution of the us versus them left-right dynamic that has divided the Spanish society for so long. The new emerging us versus them takes the form of the bottom versus the top, society against la casta, or the political class. The impacts of this transformation are only beginning to be felt, and it's impossible to know what form they will take or how long they will last. What is clear, however, is that contesting and breaking down common sense understandings of the culture of Spain's democratic transition was and is absolutely crucial to this process of transformation. My own work over the past 20 years or so has always been preoccupied with this relationship between culture, ideology, and politics. But I had never thought about this insistence on the importance of culture as being a particularly feminist position, even though I fully embrace feminism and I find much inspiration in feminist theories. But in reading an interview with Rosie Braidotti recently, I was struck by her words in reference to the Occupy movement and to the Alter Globalization movement. And she said this, I don't see any feminism there. I see the masculinism of what's left of the left doing what the left has always done in creating leadership positions for the boys and monopolizing the notion of the political. Zizek, Badiou, and all the great anti-feminists and critical theorists of today entirely dismiss the intellectual capital of feminism in one stroke because it's only cultural and not political, according to their definition of the political as political theology. So if we're not in the Schmidian thing of the friend and the enemy, we don't have a politics? Feminism's pacifism rules out politics? Thank you, brothers. She then reminds us of history. She reminds us of the confrontation in Italy between the Trotskyites and the feminists in Rome in the 60s and 70s, where the Trotskyites advocated a politics of confrontation and the feminists were advocating nonviolent, not in my name politics. And this idea of politics as an us versus them, as a confrontation, as being predicated on negativity and violence, or at the very least as being determined by outcomes in a very narrowly defined political sense, or in a very narrowly defined political arena, has certainly been very dominant in the European left for many years. So Braidotti asks, what constitutes the political? That is still one of the most crucial questions to ask. And I think this is a really crucial question. What constitutes the political? Our conception of what constitutes the political will shape the strategies that we adopt to engage in social transformation. David Harvey recently said, activism is fundamentally important. And I think the problem is the left's inability to channel it into anything. There are a number of reasons for that, but I think the most important of them is the left's failure to abandon its traditional focus on production in favor of a politics of everyday life. In my view, the politics of the everyday is the crucible where revolutionary energies might develop and where we can already see activities that are seeking to define what a non-alienated life might look like. So that's the end of Harvey's quote. And I think what recently happened with the Syriza election, where Tsipras appointed only men to lead the 10 ministerial portfolios, threw into really high visibility these limitations. Because it showed us that, indeed, one could have a discourse of the bottom against the top that was at the same time utterly deficient in essential aspects of a socially transformative political project. That decision was like a slap in the face or a dose of ice cold water. Choose your metaphor. But as bad as that was, what was much worse, what was followed. As critical journalist Ignacio Escolar tweeted, 
There is something that has surprised me more than this disappointing decision of Tsipras not to name a single woman minister. And that is how many people justify it. He wrote an excellent article called The Fallacies That Justify Sexism based on the tweets that he was sent justifying Tsipras's decision. And I want to draw on just a few examples from his article to show just how easy, how easily, the exclusion of women from whole arenas of political participation is justified and all in the name of a leftist or progressive politics. The first common justification was that gender parity was not as important as solving Greece's urgent problems. So one person tweeted, Tsipras needs to save millions from poverty, but hey, they better wait until they have a gender balanced government. This is a very common argument that has been used historically to set up a hierarchy of priorities and most importantly sets up a false opposition between two political goals. As if the two choices we have available to us are either solving Greece's problems or having women in the cabinet. When we hear these kinds of arguments, we need to stop and ask, are these two goals in any way incompatible? Why do we need to choose between having women ministers and saving the Greeks from poverty or saving them from the Troika? It's only a valid opposition if we assume that women cannot effectively work to solve Greece's problems. And why do we assume that it will take Tsipras any longer to appoint women ministers than men, as the tweet implies? This assumption only makes sense if we also assume that there are few women qualified to be ministers, or in this specific case, no women at all in the entire country of Greece that could possibly fill this role, not a single one. And therefore, it would take Cyprus weeks or even months to find a woman, whereas qualified men, of course, are obviously ready to hand. They're just crawling out of the woodwork. And of course, this is another common justification and one that was used by Cyprus himself, that he needed to choose the most qualified people. This is a good one. Even if we do assume that there is a single most qualified person for a given job, a very questionable assumption indeed, and that Cyprus or anyone else can figure out somehow who that person is, if we accept that the reason all of the ministers are male is because they are the most qualified people for the job, then we're also being asked to accept that the reason that men dominate in positions of leadership through virtually every sector of society is because they too are the most qualified for their job. Which means we need to accept that, despite women making up over 50% of the population, and contrary to all the empirical evidence in Europe as to women's qualifications, women are simply not as qualified as men. Which means that we accept that women are inferior to men. There's another really common justification, and this is probably one of the stupidest, yet one of the most frequent, that you hear from all kinds of people. Once again, it places particular conditions on women's political participation, and it goes like this. I believe in women's participation in politics, but just look at Margaret Thatcher. <laughs> Or as one tweet in Escolar's <laughs> article featuring photos of two women ministers in Spain put it, only two photos and now keep criticizing Syriza's government for not having women. And Escolar wrote back, the fact that one female minister does a bad job doesn't mean that all women are going to do a bad job. <laughs> 
you could repeat the exact same argument with a photograph of the Prime Minister and the Minister of Culture as proof of masculine incompetence and it would still be a fallacy. And I would add, why on earth would a left-wing government appoint a right-wing minister to their cabinet? Very confusing. These arguments place a hypothetical common good above and in false opposition to women's political participation. They place conditions on women's political participation and on their leadership, either in terms of when they can participate, after we solve Greek poverty, and after we stick it to the Troika, or under what conditions they can participate, only if you're not like Margaret Thatcher, or under a series of assumptions that we need to question. Women are not as qualified as men, Greek women are culturally not <coughs> equipped to lead or be accepted as leaders, etc. And all of these arguments can be deployed while leaving intact a superficial conception of the political that revolves exclusively around the notion of the bottom against the top. Because it's much easier to detect and to attack hegemonic narratives that clearly defend the interests of political and economic elites than it is to detect and counter narratives that uphold a patriarchal status quo or a racist one or a homophobic one that is entwined in the daily lives of an entire society. And this is why relying on a strategy of forming new social majorities against a delegitimized elite has important limitations when we're trying to confront issues like feminism. Because in this case, countering hegemonic narratives requires delving into our own consciousness, into our own relationships, into our own discourse, into our own behavior, and not just dismantling the narratives of the other. The enemy is within. It's in our spaces, it's in our daily relationships, it manifests itself in all those forms of microsexism that even committed feminists can sometimes reproduce. And the fact of the matter is that women will never be a social majority for the simple reason that we're only a little bit more than half of the population. And discourses of intersectionality, as useful and necessary as they are in many respects, decrease even more the possibility of a social majority based on the feminine condition. But none of this implies that we can't create a feminist social majority. And this is still the huge outstanding task that we face, one of them. Creating the feminist majority, creating a new feminist hegemony, by which I mean a new common sense predicated on a moral, cultural, and symbolic order that shapes the terrain on which all debate and discussion takes place and outside of whose parameters a sexist posture would seem completely irrelevant. But to do that, we need to do what the 15M did. We need to relentlessly dismantle the old common sense that encompasses all of those arguments that serve to justify the status quo, all those boys will be boys arguments, all those refusals to recognize the myriad ways in which women's subordination, marginalization, and exclusion is reproduced, all those appeals to cultural relativism, ideological hierarchies, and false oppositions, which still today, even after hundreds of years of feminism, continue to sound so commonsensical to so many people. It's worth remembering that the influence of feminism in the 15M movement, such as it has been, did not spontaneously arise out of a revolutionary moment. It was the result of the concerted effort of feminists before the occupation of the square, in the square, and after the square to engage in pedagogical work, to reshape the very language of the movement, which is a task still ongoing, to make visible forms of microsexism, and to dismantle and relentlessly challenge arguments that serve to maintain the status quo of women's oppression. And unlike Braidotti, I do see this work as bearing very important fruit, 
even if we still have a long way to go. But I do see a gap between what is happening in the social movements that I, um, that I participate in, the social movement spaces that I'm in, and what happens when we leave those social movement spaces, we transcend them, and we enter into a more public and a more institutional political arena. For example, from Cairo to London to Madrid, I still routinely see the ratio of male to female interventions in public arenas as at least three to one, and sometimes more imbalanced. When we look at the turn to institutional politics, we can also see patterns that are very disquieting. Even in a party like Podemos, which is committed to gender parity in the electoral lists, we see a huge imbalance in the election to the top positions of party leadership. At the autonomous level, the disparity for secretary generals was 13 men to three women, and at the municipal level, in large municipalities, the disparity was 13 men to two women. That's a huge difference. And this is a feminist party. What does it mean? It means that even in a progressive, explicitly feminist party, participants in that party are still seeing male leadership as more desirable than female leadership for the top positions. It means that given that those candidates that are endorsed by the party cupola are much more likely to get elected, leadership cannot simply rely on an open voting system to make sure that women are fully represented in leadership positions in the party. And we can't reflect on the impact of 15M on Spanish democracy without talking precisely about this unprecedented turn towards electoral politics. Unprecedented for autonomous social movements imbued with strong libertarian tendencies. For a movement like 15M that defined itself from the very first moment as resolutely a partisan, this remarkable evolution deserves some reflection. All the more so as more and more activists have become swept up in the possibility of real electoral change in Spain at all three levels of government. Undoubtedly, this change, this evolution, has been one of the unintended consequences of the 15M movement. Of course, the possibility of overturning austerity politics and of addressing some of the needs of the citizens who are suffering, the, conference, the consequences of this crisis swindle, is a wonderful thing. But for historical reasons, we have legitimate cause for concern. If we look at Spain in particular, the rise of Podemos with its charismatic leadership puts us in mind of Felipe González's leadership of the PSOE in the 1980s. Then too, many people who were active in movements either left those movements to enter into institutional politics, which were very exciting at the time, as is happening now, or else they stopped being activists because they felt that with the entry of the PSOE into the government, the major problems of society would be addressed from the government without the need for an active grassroots mobilizing around these issues. And this danger is not lost on longtime activist Pablo Iglesias, nor indeed on Juan Carlos Monedero, who recently stepped down from the party leadership because he felt it was getting too removed from its base in the movements. The relationship between parties and movements is fraught with tension. Some years ago, I was giving a, a talk in Bonn, and one of the people in the public said, you speak as though social movements are always necessary to democracy, but at some point, once the right party and people come to power, won't they cease to be necessary? His question, again, reflects a quite narrow understanding of the range of impacts and goals of social movements as being restricted to affecting change in the political sphere, narrowly defined. But it also reflects a linear progression of history <laughs> that is more or less stable progressive outcomes over time. And of course, neither of these things are true. One activist of Real, uh, Democracia Real, yeah, Real Democracy Now, one of the groups who originally was behind 15M, he explained his decision to enter into electoral politics like this. He said, we need to be in 
in these processes that are happening now because we want to act as a democratic check on the process. Okay? And I think that's a very healthy attitude to take, certainly. But it's worth remembering that electoral politics, no matter how participatory, have a fundamentally different logic and operate in a differently structured field of action than do social movements. Social movements are crucial in democracy no matter who's in power. All social movements go through periods of high visible mobilization and periods of greater latency. The 15M movement has undoubtedly transformed over the past four years. On the one hand, it has multiplied, it's produced myriad political projects that are still active and are still very important. But there's also no question that the large numbers of people that were in those assemblies are no longer there, that mass swelling after the acampada, and that after the initial success of Podemos in the European elections, many of those 15 assemblies have sometimes in toto converted themselves into Podemos circles or into spaces devoted to municipal initiatives in Spain. By definition, electoral politics are state-centric in the sense that they focus on state institutions as the primary sphere within which political transformation takes place. And in a context like Spain, where the voices of millions of people have not only fallen on deaf ears, but have been met by the passing of laws to restrict our democratic right to protest, it's not surprising that many have turned to electoral politics. And the restricting of rights and the return to authoritarianism is another unintended consequence of 15M. But I agree with activist writer and researcher Marta Malo, who questions the idea that many movement practices have reached a glass ceiling and that the only way to break through this glass ceiling is to make the leap from movements into institutional politics. She points out that the logic of neoliberalism in a globalized society transcends government institutions and permeates every aspect of our lives, from economic and financial power to desire itself. She also points out that while it's possible that we need to rethink this dichotomy between state and movements in light of what's happening today, she also stresses, as I do, that there are fundamental differences in logic between movement and electoral practices that are not easily translatable between each other, despite having important points of connection. The key for her is that one logic, that is to say, the electoral logic, doesn't subsume or absorb the movement logic. I agree with Malo that the risk that we run when we place our hopes and energies into the electoral strategies is to set aside deeper debates and strategies that do not fit comfortably within the field of electoral politics. I do believe that there are a tremendous amount of things that can be done from the government institutions that need to be done urgently and that breaking the bipartisan hold on Spanish democracy, fundamentally questioning this common sense, changing our idea of what's even possible in democracy are tremendous achievements of the 15M movement. But there is a 15M saying that says, we are going slow because we are going far. Urgency cannot be an excuse to set aside deep questioning and reflexivity about not only what we do, but how we do it. In Spain today, we are standing, at the very least, before the possibility of overturning some of the more criminal and tragic policies of austerity. But it would be a mistake not only to think that an institutional transformation will address the many challenges and problems we still face, but also to think that the greatest achievement of 15M has been the creation of these new electoral initiatives. In fact, if we follow the classic formulation of evaluating social movement success in terms of their political impacts, narrowly defined, that I started the talk with, we might actually see this as the greatest failure of the 15M in that it was incapable of translating citizen outrage and demands into a change in government policies. But if we did that, we would be falling back into the logic of the professor who asked what good 15M had done. 
We can't blame the movements, and believe me, people do this all the time, for the absolute refusal of our political elites to listen to the people. Movement blaming is engaged, usually, by people who themselves do little to change things and then complain when others do not effectively mobilize on their behalf. These are the same people who then justify their lack of action by repeating the refrain that all that protesting really doesn't make a difference. Or who see movements as the temporary coalescence of political desires that then need to be effectively channeled into a real politics, by which they mean electoral politics. The transformation of Spanish democracy is and will always be a work in progress, with no linear progression towards a better future. In order to effect a truly profound transformation, we will need to be able to find a way to generate a new common sense that does not only rest on the rejection of corrupt political elites, of the contraposition of a social majority of those below against those above, but that includes a strong commitment to justice and not just equality that can address the injustices such as gender oppression, homophobia, racism, or indeed classism that emanate from and traverse those 99% below as much as the 1% above. And that no replacement of those above by however an enlightened leadership will be able to solve without the consistent work of social movements and of all of us to replace common sense with good sense. Thank you for listening.